This is the in-between time. Here in Wild Cove in White Bay, as in most inshore fishing towns on the northeast coast, the snow and the ice have brought most things to a halt. February is only a few days old. Spring and the start of the new fishing season is three long cold months away. No trouble for the youngsters to find something to do, but while there's action in the streets, the wharves and stages are cold and deserted. Many fishermen in White Bay keep their boats here in Fleur de Lis during the winter. The wind usually keeps the heavy ice out of this harbor. Most of these smaller boats will stay tied up until May, but the big ones, the 65 footers, are nowhere to be seen. February dawn, sharp eyes are scanning the ice. The wind is bitter, but the landsman's gaze does not falter. The longliner Polar Venture is steaming after seals. It's the first time since last fall that skipper Harold Small and his brother Mark have been out on the water and they've been looking forward to this moment. Well, it's good to get on the go again and make a, a dollar because we tie up our boats around the last October just after the iron fishery was over and there's usually nothing else to do then for about February when the seal starts, starts showing up. So. so it's good to be back on the water again. Breaking through the icy grip that has kept them ashore for months, these fishermen look on sealing as a renewal, an important start for the year's fishery. If we didn't make no money seal fish for winter time, you know, that's the, that's the only thing there is to do then from the from October month up until the latter part of May, you know, so the sealing in the income then uh, means a great lot to us because we got a few dollars to do the boats upward again and, and get ready for the fishery. And if you want to spend a bit of money on your gear, you got a few dollars and so, uh, I think without the seal fishery, you know, we'd be all at last on the northeast coast. A rope is slipped around the seal and it's winched aboard. Great care is taken not to damage the pelt. A top quality seal skin can fetch up to $44. The slightest flaw can lose you $10 or more on a pelt. His knife razor sharp, one of Harold's crew members skillfully cuts the pelt from the carcass. Up top, the vigil continues. Harold and his crew usually keep the carcasses, hoping they can sell the meat when they get back in port. But most times, they end up throwing it away. There'll be a lot of pelting today, because Harold struck a good patch of seals. 
Well, when you're at it, you know, every day, you usually know where the seals hangs out at, and sometimes you've got to steam on for miles, and you come across a bunch of seals, perhaps where there's bait hanging around, you know, whitefish and capelin, and uh, usually, the, usually the seals feed on that. Sometimes you gotta you gotta go after them perhaps a half a dozen times before you can get them to stop good enough to get shot at, you know. But you gotta be quick on the gun. That's the, the main thing in, in hunting hunting seals in the water, you know. And usually you know where he's gonna break up at when, uh, when you've been at it for so long. Just about every seal taken by landsmen in Newfoundland is sold to the Carino plant in Dildo. The sealers don't know what they'll get for each pelt until the skins are trucked to Dildo and graded. But they take steps to make sure the pelts are top quality. Perhaps the most important step, once the seal is on board and skinned, is the brushing on of a liquid called anti-yellow. Without this anti-yellow on the fur, no time at all, the seal skin begins to be yellow and then you lose a tremendous amount of money on it. You know. If we're going to get a good value for our pills, we got to put a lot of effort into it. The days are short in February, and as the light fails, all hands head for the warm. Well, the first part of the winter, when we, when we start off, we, we, usually, we usually seal around Wheat Bay area, out around the Horse Islands, and, and get back in every night. But then as the spring comes on, in well, March and April, and then we go farther out and hunt the seals. Well, there's times you've got to go off, you know, 60, 70 miles, so... And sometimes then we're out for a week or two on end, you know. The sun is up, and Harold and his crew aren't far behind. You've got to put long hours in at this business if you want to make a go of it. You can't go out now sealing and bring in a half a dozen seals a day in long liner because, you know, if you go out sealing, eh, you're going to burn maybe 100 gallons of fuel a day. And the fuel right now, I think, is up $1.85 a gallon. So you're into $185. You've got to be almost sure now that you're going to get a good number of seals before you can hand tie the boat. Good. What's a good number? What's a good catch? Well, let's say you want 15, you know, to make, because you've got to have three or four men, and he needs about $50 a day. Usually when we go out, you know, we stay for a week in the, in the spring of the year, you know, perhaps, or perhaps you get a couple under seals, you know, in, in a week or a week and a half like that. So then you got a very good trip, see? But this going out now every day and burning 100 gallons of fuel, getting eight or 10 seals, you know, is hardly paying. When the weather's good, Harold puts a speedboat over the side. That way, there's two boats after the seals, doubling his chances of getting a good catch. And for the past few years, Harold and his crew have been among the highliners in the landsman seal fishery. Well, last year we we brought in around around sixty five thousand dollars worth of pilts. Now last year I had seven men involved with me in the seal fishing. So what I what I usually do, I take a little higher share for the boat, you know, like, and then I divide the rest up into equal shares. I take the same for myself as I gives the crew. So last year, for instance, I, uh, the men was with me, they earned around, around, around $6,000 on sealing, you know. The fuel now is shared up among the shares, the men's shares, you know. 
and the boat stands to us here. So uh, I don't end up with all that much money out of it after all for myself, you know, because the men gets a good dollar out of it. The money is the most important reason for being out here. But there's also the challenge of the seal fishery that keeps bringing Harold back. Matching wits with the seals. Sometimes first when the seal breaks up, you know, he'll, he'll look at the boat and, and size it all up. But then most times after that, once he makes out the object, you know, he's, he'll get away then, you know. You gotta be a pretty crack shot or do you miss occasion? Well, there's no trouble to miss them. It's easier to miss them than to strike them, you know. But uh, usually a very good shot. If he gives Arbit, Arbit of a chance at all, you, know, you usually get them. Lately, however, it's the sealers that have become the targets. Protesters have branded them barbarians and convinced many people in Europe not to buy sealskin products. At first, it was just the white coat hunt and the big sealing ships they were after. But now, the landsmen too are threatened. This is where most, most of the trouble started off in the white coat hunt, you know, the protest movement come around years before there was any restriction on them. And they went out and they made pictures of the white coat hunt. And, and maybe the hard fellows and took them out there and give the white coats a bad time, you know, and problem them. And, Skinning them alive, perhaps. And, and all that was blamed on the Newfoundland, the Newfoundland sealers, you know. And I think this have after given the, the the seal industry a black eye. But had, had we had more control over it in the beginning and not not let those groups out there in the beginning, I don't think we'd have been in the state we're in today. And the state the seal fishery is in today is not good. All the publicity put out by the protesters has hurt the market for seal skins very badly. European fur dealers say it's almost to the point where you can't give them away. For Newfoundland's 4,000 landsmen, it's a crisis. Sealing puts an estimated $3 million into their pockets every winter. Up to now, they've been happy to go about their business and let the politicians argue their case. But things have only gotten worse. This year, landsmen like Harold Small decided it was time to fight for themselves. I think we have after leaving it up, leaving it up to the governments for a long time. And well, maybe they've been trying to do all their best or do all they could do, you know. But it hasn't went away, you know. We've lost everything we, everything we had, you know. This year, she's right down to the rock bottom. Our backs is against the wall, so we just we just had to move, you know. Remember the thrill of getting candy when you were young? Did you ever outgrow your love for purity candy kisses or peppermint knobs and lumps or the sweet, clean taste of purity syrups? Remember the jewel-like colors reflected in the bottles? Maybe it's time for you to indulge yourself and your favorite little ones with the treats of your childhood. You've never forgotten the special feeling of being treated. Why not pass it along? Purity candies and syrups are found throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. This is where the fun starts. It's you and Skidoo for 1983. And it's all for you at Charles R. Bell Limited. View the 1983 Skidoo lineup. From the dependable Elan to the powerful Scandic, Skidoo combines sleek, stylish lines and advanced engineering technology to produce the Bombardier Skidoo lineup for 1983. It's their best yet. Make it yours. You and Skidoo with Charles R. Bell Limited, St. John's and Grand Falls. Decorate your home with the quality of matchless paint. Satin finish, semi-gloss, gloss, or flat. When it's matchless, you can be sure of quality paints in whatever finish you require for any room in your home. Available in a complete range of colors to suit your decorating needs. With matchless, the quality is guaranteed. Make your life more colorful with matchless paint. It's the paint for you. Hello, I'm Clyde Rose from Breakwater. 
For the past 10 years, Breakwater has been publishing books of quality for Newfoundlanders. Books such as Down by Jim Long Stage, and more recently, The Winds Softly Sigh in our Folklore Folk Life series. Now we are proud to present the great gift of heritage, the Dictionary of Newfoundland English, compiled by Professors Kerwin, Story, and Widdowson, with the assistance of thousands of other Newfoundlanders. Give this great gift of heritage today. Bayvert in late November. The parking lot of the local high school is full. Over 100 landsmen from all over the province are here to attend a sealers conference. Since last spring, the industry's troubles have deepened. Markets are collapsing. There's talk of a ban on seal products in Europe. The sealers have come to Bayvert to see if they can organize and fight back. One of the forces behind this conference is Harold Small. I think I was about one of the first ones that decided we might have a conference, you know. To try to draw the different resource people together, government officials and fishermen from all across the island, like, you know, and get together in one group and see and see what we could do, see if there's any solution to the old, to the old problem, you know, and focus on whether, you know, we were going to have a hunt in 1983. Inside the hall, there's a display of sealskin goods. Pelts, mitts, and boots. The sealers admire them. But deep down, they worry that these may soon be museum pieces, relics of a lost industry. Not going to make much of a speech, and I don't when the conference gets really down to business, to Harold Small sets the tone with an emotional speech. The sealing industry has been going on in Newfoundland now for hundreds of years. And to my knowledge, I don't think ever before that <coughs> there have been so many people gathered together in one room to try to solve some of the problems of the seal fishing. And to see what's happening now to our markets, I feel it's kind of filled up this morning because I've had to put a lot of in effort into it the last years. Not only me, but a great number of sealers there. I've had to invest in hundreds and thousands of dollars in boats. And to see that this morning that maybe we won't, we won't even have a seal fishery, you know, it kind of hurts me. For two days, the sealers hear about vanishing markets about prices less than half what they were last year. Even about Canadian officials in London saying the seal fishery may be on the way out. But the sealers came here to organize and try to turn things around. In the end, they form an association to tell their side of the story, to fight for the survival of their industry. After the conference, I asked three landsmen and a fur dealer to talk about the future of the seal fishery. The landsmen are Harold Small of White Bay, Ace Payne of Cowhead, and Jack Croak of Toolingate. The fur dealer is George Whitman of the Hudson's Bay Company. First of all, I'd like to ask you know, three sealers what uh, a collapse of the seal market would do to you fellas? Well, a collapse of the sealing industry to the sealers that's involved in this industry would mean a difference between survival and, and uh, bankruptcy, if you want to put it down to the finer points. Just, you know, it means a difference between a profit and a loss. That's basically what it's coming down to because the sealing industry provides us with a huge start to obtain fishing gear and equipment for our summer fishery. There's a lot of people around David Peninsula and Notre Dame Bay involved in the fishery, the seal fishery, and they've after, they've after gearing up for it now over the years and investing a lot of money in their boats and uh, and they're looking and they're looking forward to those extra dollars every spring, you know that. To get them on a good start for the summer, and if we got a, a draw on a, unemployment from November up until June, we're not going to have a, any money left to, to start fishing with. 
There's not only a sealer that's uh, it's going to be down the tube, the man on the main line that makes our ammunition, the truckers. Uh, we got the 40 or 50, maybe 60 employees in the oil plant. You name it. Right across the whole country. You know, so you're looking at an industry. It's mm. not just the, the, the sealers that go to the lease and go to the airships of acquiring a few seals and to uh, help us get our summer started. So you're also talking about <clears throat> there's people employed all over the world in the fur trade. So you're not just talking about the sealers. You're talking about an industry. Well, how bad are the markets? Right at the present time, there is, there is no market for seals in Europe. At Leningrad, about two weeks ago, there were 18,500 white coats offered for sale. They were withdrawn because there were no bidders. We have just shipped uh, our last inventory of uh, seal skins to London, England, and uh, we will await uh, whatever offers might come up at the, uh, at the next first sale. However, we are not at all optimistic about uh, the immediate future. Okay, if prices go down, if prices are, say, 50% of what they were last year, can you fellows make a go of it? I don't think so. Because that brings them down 60% from what they were in 1981. So no way can you can you operate into an industry that are after losing 60% of its value, eh? And your other costs are going up. And the your other fixed cost, cost, fuel, ammunition. Cost is going up 100% from what it was a couple of years ago, you know, so no way can we operate on that on that basis so uh, if we don't find a solution to it somebody got to got to come up with a subsidy uh. what would happen if in canada uh, we began dressing processing the skins and making them into uh, clothing is that a viable alternative i think? say it would be a viable we've already discussed that uh, this morning as you know <coughs> And we're starting to look at that as a viable alternative. And maybe you, you might need markets in Europe. I think that other markets exist uh, other than Europe. Uh, but what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to convince Canadians that they should buy at home. They should buy a <coughs> Canadian manufactured product. And given our population, which is only 25 million, I believe there is a limited market. No one has really tried. I think there is a market in Newfoundland and the rest of Canada. To what extent, I wouldn't be able to elaborate on. Uh, I was looking at a pair of boots uh, on display down there in the uh, auditorium where we're holding our conference. I'd like to have a pair, but I'm not able to get a pair. The question I'd have there is why? You know. Uh, we're killing seals in Newfoundland, and when it, they come to buying a, a seal product, we're unable to get it. You know, to take up on your point, the government of Canada right now is looking to provide dollars to create new jobs, and here's a wonderful opportunity to to get Newfoundlanders into uh, into processing and uh, wholesaling a material that. Uh, will provide a lot of profits and a lot of jobs. And maybe we'll have to talk to our women to wear more seal skin coats. If we get dammed up over in Europe, say we can't move our pelts, our furs, we're going to have to spread out in Canada in, in, in some other ways, explore some other avenues, you know. And if we can produce our own skins here in Canada instead of hauling them across to Norway, getting them done, hauling them back and making up our things, Maybe we'll get a higher value for the skins here in Newfoundland and we won't have to kill so many seals. What we're talking about now is what we do if the European market is gone. Now, is it too late? Is that market gone? Is it possible to win it back? I think it's possible to get that market back. I think the, one of the primary things that we have to do to get that market back is for somebody it was involved in the sealing industry, and I, I mean sealers as well as other people, to go to the EEC countries and give them the facts involved with the seal fishery. Not a bunch of garbage, as some protest group or some other bunch has gone with a bunch of lies and a bunch of phony information and all this kind of garbage. 
act now. Make sure the pressure is put on these countries and make them aware that we'll share over and we want a seal fishery. But we want action now from our federal government. Hello. Not if or maybe, but now. Oh yeah, something got to be done now for the, for the 1983 season, just right around the corner, you know, so. Somebody is going to have to come up with some pretty bright ideas between this and February, you know, when, when the sealers, we got to get home, we got to get the seals when they're there, you know, so. Someone got to come up with some solution before that time, you know. The way I see it is we have to have our backs up against the wall before we're going to do anything. And the time that we're about to start to do something is right now. I'm quite optimistic that, there's, that we can do it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure we can do it. Oh yeah, I think it's a fight we can win. Uh, they put a man on the moon, I think for sure we can sell a few seal skins or a few seal pelts, you know.